walk the cows in. So those are the steps. Remove the trees. Have a way to get them off here because you can't come in and unroll hay if you left the trees. You got to get them out of here. And so we just stacked them. The landowner didn't mind me stacking them. When you come here in the winter time, every brush pile around this whole farm is still here. And there's just thousands of critters, you can, well, maybe not thousands, but hundreds of critters using those brush piles. They're living in them. The one over the hill here, we've actually got a, I've seen bobcats on that several times. There's a den of bobcats living over there. But you know what? We run sheep in here. People, oh, you got bobcats, you got sheep. Yeah, because we got five guard dogs. Those brush piles are providing food for the bobcats. Think about that. So for every species, for every species that you can grow onto your farm, make a home for it, they support eight additional ones. Think about it as a dominoes effect. Don't think about it as killing them. And that was me. I used to wake up every morning, this is a great day to go kill something. And I was going broke. So don't, don't have that mentality. So now we bring the carbon in. So we took a wooded area like that, nothing in there, no food, and we're bringing the carbon source in the hay and then rolling it. Man, there was seed going everywhere off that hay, so we got a lot of natural reseeding. That's where this came from, I'm pretty sure. Because some of the hay we fed was um, Indian grass hay. Um, there's quite a bit of it just popping up this year. I didn't see any Indian grass the first two years, and now it's starting to pop. Did you seed the orchard grass or it no, just came in the No, no, nothing was seeded in here. I didn't put down any seed, just hay. How long has this been cleared? Three, three years. Yeah. And, and it was about that thick? Oh, it was, as, it was thicker than that. Okay. Jacob started on that side of the chainsaw. I started on this side. We tried to meet in the middle. We didn't want to be dropping trees. And you know, you got earplugs on, you listen to that guy's song, like, where's that tree coming? <laughs> so he was way down there and I was down here. So we didn't have to worry about dropping trees on each other. We got closer to each other, then I joined up, and I got on the tractor, and I started removing the trees as he cut them. And we just pushed them. We just pushed them down into there. Did you do anything with the brush before you started cutting the trees? No. No the brush? No, all the brush is down there. That's where hogs would come in, is you could run hogs after you dropped the trees or before, but they're like early on. I'd run them after I dropped the trees, and yeah. then come in and push the brush out. But the hogs are the... They wouldn't come back now or you'd just tear this up. Oh yeah, hogs would just plow this. Um, this is some pretty good grass, folks. Real good, here. real good. Uh, now the lime truck, we had that lime the three times. He didn't cross the driveway, so none of this, other than what he could reach from that driveway, had got any lime put on it. So this is just basically hay, livestock, being sheep and cattle. So we, we started out with 132 inch wire. He's in timeless. Uh, as the line post, and we got you see some fiberglass corners in there where we needed to make a bend. And I'm like, well, we got to get sheep in here. And that's all these sprouts coming up. So we started out with poly wire. We just ran a poly wire beside them. I'm like, that's silly. Let's just go ahead and add one more line. So we already had the post, and the timeless are all drilled on four inch centers, three inches, three, inch. with three inch. All we had to do is just unroll wire. The corner posts are already there, the fiberglass. So we just had to drill a hole in them, and then we just ran a wire all the way around this whole farm. Now, this landowner wanted the fence. He wanted the fence. He didn't want me to take it with him at the end of the lease. So that's written in the lease. He bought all the posts, all the wire. He supplied the labor. So Jacob and I came in here and cleared all the brush, rolled up all the old fence out there, treated the stumps the best we could, got rid of all the old <coughs> wire, and then we built the new fence. And when they came out, they, they didn't come out here the whole time you're we doing all that. So I called them up. I said, you all like to have some meat? Well, Greg, you're, you know, it's not January. The deal was that the lease starts in January. So I'm going to cover that a little bit. If you go lease a piece of property, you're right, the written lease. And it needs infrastructure put in. Fence, water, maybe a handling facility, whatever. Don't start the lease until the animals are placed on the farm. Mm. So I leased, I actually started working on this in July. It took us all summer to get all this brush cleared, get the fence put in, and by January, I was ready. Mm. And we had already had some hay placed here, brought the animals in, grazed what little grass was here, and then we started unrolling carbon. That first winter, we unrolled about 80 bales in here. Since then, we put down maybe 12 or 16 a winter, um, and then we moved. 
And so those people, you know, they hadn't done anything with it. They came out and saw what we'd done. Like, my gosh, Greg, this looks like a park. And that was that was what I was hoping they would say. And so this is a couple of asked me to come out and build a campfire at night. Now. <laughs> you certainly can. Come on out. <laughs> so they're a wonderful couple. They appreciate what we've done. They've deeded the farm already to their kids. The kids are 28 and 30. The kids like coming out. Spending, they, they'll camp out out here. And uh, they, they like, what they're, like what we're doing. So Jan and I are looking at building two more ponds on this property. One is right down there at the edge of the woods. It's a little old uh, impression. There used to be a pond there. It was probably built by horses back in the 1800s. You can still see the old dam on it. It'd be so awesome to have a little pond right there. We will push up some trees, get some sunlight in there, so we can grow some grass around it. Now on the back of the farm, there's another little impression. It's kind of a mud hole. I mean, it, you can't depend on it for anything. But we're going to go in there with a dozer and dig that out. We're going to pay for that. He gave us a free lease. Folks, if you can get the lease, the, the lease, the landowner to give you a free lease, you can afford to go in and do some, some, some things like that. And that builds trust, it builds confidence, and it builds a, a relationship. Of course, we're going to stock the ponds, too. We'll just put, because she likes to fish, the, 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 the uh, wife does. She's a fishing nut. Greg, why, why would you put a pond right there? Is it just more of a landscaping feature? No, it would be handy to have water right here. Because now, right now, we've got one pond. It's clear back in the center of the farm. And we have to use poly water to come clear back here to the road to run them back. I can put in a pond down here, folks, for $800. And then we can maybe start recapturing some of these. Yep. Yeah, We're supposed to be going down these ridges and recreating what we did right here. So this is a big farm. You're only looking at... 20% of it. It goes way back in there. It goes way down. Oh, I didn't tell you that. We touch it on three sides. Mm -hmm. other we, farms. Yeah, other farms. So we got a farm over there released. we got one on the back and, of course, right across the road. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, we're, oh, oh, no, we got another one on that side. We've got it surrounded. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, uh, other landowners, they get the thing in Brooklyn County. I get first chance to buy it. But will your lease supersede the transfer? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's typically how it's going to be. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to put this kind of labor into something, you need to write that into the lease. Yeah. Yeah. So, and anything you put in that is yours, make sure you stipulate that. If they don't pay for the fence and the post, you need to take those with you. Personal property. John, right. Do you have an example of one of those leases? Uh, yeah, in the book. Norris Ranchy. The first one. Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay, let's, uh, any questions on this particular yeah. spot right here? How, how low do you cut? Do you cut right down to the... Yeah, the I cut them off as close as I can. Don't stick the chainsaw down in the soil. Uh, I had an intern, I told him I wanted them close. <laughs> and, um, and so he would be gone about five minutes. He's coming back. He said, this thing won't cut. Brand new chain. Brand new chain. I'm like, well, what, what's going on? I said, well, it won't cut us. And we'll cut one off for me. <coughs> he stuck the bar down under the dirt. <laughs> he said, well, you wanted them close. I'm like, I'm sorry. I didn't stipulate exactly how close. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, folks, when you brush hog in here, here's one right here. So that's a mole. Right yeah. 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 Yeah, right here. So when you brush hog in, folks, don't. You know, you got to raise that thing up about six to eight inches. If you hit that stump, you're going to shell out either your universal or your tractor, or you're going to break the. Uh, you're going to well, you're going to break the. Uh, 
you got to break the whole bottom off the threshold. The gearbox. The gearbox, yeah. Did that. $2,500. Yeah, my lifetime lease owner over here, he left his darn stump. That sucker was about that tall. And it all grown up in brush. Yeah. And I drove over that puppy. And I mean, the whole brush all jumped up in the air. And that great big drum under there, the whole thing came out from underneath the brush. Oh. I'm like, that pretty much does that. <laughs> and uh, $2,500 later, I had it fixed. You always come on the brush hog. What about a, a flail mower? Uh, I believe it'd be worse. I think it would probably be worse. The bush hog or brush hog has what they call a stump jumper. It doesn't jump them very well, <laughs> but but it it protects that gear a little bit. Mine's got a slip clutch on it. I didn't oil it. See me on a slip clutch. When you start to see them, you're supposed to loosen those bolts up and make sure it'll slip. I didn't do that. So it it, it didn't slip. It's like a direct drive. Lucky it didn't shell out my. PCO on my track. That would have been really nasty. We're talking probably ten thousand dollars. So I'm always cautious on stuff like this. I'm going really slow. I raised up my brush off because you know what? If you run over that stump with that back tire, even the front tire of your tractor, you feel it. It's rough in here. And because my tractor has solid rubber tires on it, I poured them full of rubber. That way I never had a flat again. It wasn't cheap, but you know, a flat tire on a tractor is not cheap to repair, especially the rear tire. You pay a farm call and then get it repaired, you're looking at five to six hundred dollars. Yeah, who does the rubber fill? Uh, place in Columbia is called. Um, it was Midwest Tire. They've been bought out by. Oh, I forgot the name of them. It starts with a T. Halt tire. What is it? Halt. Halt. Halt tire. How do you pronounce that? How do you spell? P-U-N? Oh, pump. Yeah. Pump tire. Pump yeah. tire. They've got a phone number. Matter of fact, our lifetime lease owner, he's got a tractor down there he just bought, brand new. He's putting it in. A, a small utility tractor. And he was going to bring it home and said, Steve, you're going to be running over thorn trees. You're going to have a flat. So he, he brought it by the putting it full of rubber right now. This one's a great option for high density grazing, though. Don't yes. brush off before you. Graze. No, no. We we graze this off, and then we bring the animals in. Uh, when we clear a place, folks, I get the logs. There's a great big pile of cedar. You can't even see them from here. But right over that hill, I've got them stacked up off the ground. The mill is right across the road. We're going to be walking right by it. And so we can bring that mill right over and set it up by that pile of cedar and just cut the whole thing. If you're cutting off trees, it's going to cost you some time and money. Somebody asked the other day, how much time do you spend in here killing this? I don't want to tell you how much time. <laughs> it took some time, but you know what? Today, we get to enjoy this the rest of our life. And so pay yourself. Get the trees. Mill them. Uh, you can sell the logs. I've got a pile of um, hedge, hedge posts up here. We can sell those hedge posts. you got a sawmill, you say? I've got a sawmill. If you're time. near Virginia, I'm Which getting a sawmill. <laughs> Everybody, I'm going to warn you on the sawmill. Uh, everybody, oh my gosh, that's quite a mill. I'm like, yeah, that's my race car. <laughs> Some people buy race cars. I've got a nice sawmill, okay? <laughs> um, I enjoy running it. It, it, it. it does do a good job. I can keep two people hooking with it. Um, you can really saw a ton of lumber in one day with it. But it's got, you know, it's all hydraulic. It's got the hydraulic loading and, yeah, it's pretty nice. I want to mention one more thing about the red cedar. There's a male and a female tree. The female has berries. The males aren't going to reproduce. So you can remove all the females and you won't have the little cedar volunteers. Any more questions on this? All right, let's go up here and go down and look at the sheep. We're going to be going right by with a sawmill set up. Front end motors and skid steers? I have. I'm just cool. about tempted to buy one. Just, I can, if I use it for six months and sell it for half of what I got in it, I can pay for the same size blade as that. Yeah. Pretty nice. Uh, that's good. Got a guy that does uh, 160 acres. And the sheep are here. Uh, we had to see one, two, three. We had them in here for six days. This ridge you're looking at right behind it, right in front of it, that was split into two paddocks. 
There's an old pond here on the right that we fenced off to want the animals in it. And then this ridge that we're getting ready to walk down right here in front, we got another two days off of this. So there's quite a bit of sheep that are out here. Marshall's grandfather and grandmother lived right down that hill. And they used to plow these ridges every year and put in cane. And the reason they put in cane is they made uh, molasses out of the cane. This is the farm you talked about on one of your videos. The guy used to put it all with the same soft seeders and burn stumps. Yep. That yep, that's it. There's 160 acres. Uh, between uh, Steve, uh, last time Lisa and I, we now own half of it. Dan and I bought half and he bought half. You get the front half? Still a lot of forage in here. Uh, Sheep were in here two days ago. Grass on the left and right. There's a lot of sprouts. But, uh, we didn't want them to chew it down too much, so we moved them. So all this grass is going to have a really nice chance to go back. Uh, the mob of cattle are coming this way. We're going to have a cattle drive. We'll be right where you're standing with the mob. Uh, let's see, next, about next Friday, we'll be in here. So that is just uh, the sheep that can graze this before the cows. We're probably going to use this as a lane. To get through here, that's where the sheep have not grazed, so the, the cattle won't be mad at it. Do you think that it takes about a week for that smell to go away? Yeah, it depends how much rain you get. Do you, are you paying brush hog in this field next year? Uh, yes, this is brush hog last year. We skipped it this year. It's so rough in there, folks. You can see the automolly here on the right, all those little bushes. Uh, 4,000 feet of stumps in here. Big one. Yeah, you can see all the stumps over here. Yeah, this is wood margin. I did. You read the sawmill? Yeah, I read that. Yeah, I looked at about four different ones. Somebody watching me. Wood margin is really in the sawmill. I would call it the Mercedes Benz of the sawmill. You can look at the sawmill. You can look at the sawmill. Hear the guard dogs. Yeah, so this is a wood driver. It's an LT40, I believe. Fully yeah, automatic. Fully automatic. automatic. This has got the uh, simple set right here, all computer controlled. I can stand here and run this thing, and the boys, all they've got to do is keep the logs coming to me and pulling the lumber off. So that mill, or that head, has got a 35 horse diesel on it. It goes up and down like this. And uh, of course it's got an automatic uh, hydraulic loading unit on it. Um, if you have a log like this, you've got a little skinny end down there, a big fat end down here, and I can roll that up on there. Here's my hydraulic clamp. Boom. Well, then I've also got a leveling agent right here. So I can raise I can raise that log up. I can raise that log up on the skinny end and leave the butt end down. Once you make that first cut and get it level, you index all the other cuts off of that. Cows bought this for you too? Yep. <laughs> That's a good herd. <laughs> That's a good herd. <laughs> Not <a> full, baby. <laughs> you got oh, some nice cows. Yeah. No, it came down to December. I was going to write a big check to the government. I'm like, no, I'm going to buy a sawmill. <laughs> yeah, these, these arms right here pick the log up, set it on here. This is down below. It raises up behind there and whack. It pulls it over right next to your blade. And that simple set's pretty darn cool. When you get that log square after it's made its last cut, it's going to ask you, what do you want to cut? Uh, do you want uh, six one by eights or, or two two by eights or whatever? It'll calculate that out for you. You just hit start. 
it just whacks oh, wow. them right off. Wow. Yeah. It, it's quite a tool. I wish I'd had, yes, a wood miser. I built a three story log cabin here I got out of high school. It's on my driveway. It's right there as you come up our drive. And I had an old bell saw mill. I gave a hundred bucks for it. It was a widow maker. <laughs> so you put a log on there, it might launch it here to them trees <laughs> if it got bound. I mean, it was dangerous as heck. Great big 52 inch blade sitting there turning. This is so much better. I wish I'd had something like this, but I didn't. <laughs> but yeah, it's a, it's a nice mill. How much does something like this cost? Uh, this one, I got it on sale at the end of the year. Uh, I believe it's 42000 Yeah, it, it, they're not cheap. They have cheaper versions though. They have cheaper yeah. versions. You can get an LT10 yep. for like uh, 3500 bucks, I think. That's all the hydraulics. 4000 4, for the low end. Yep. And you have to push it. You have to push that head through. And you got to either crank it up or yep. get them loaded up. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't have the hydraulic in it. So it just depends how many bills and whistle you got. And you cut green on the Yep. Yep. How wide this of a board can anything. you cut? What's that? How wide of a board can it cut? I can cut uh, 38 inches. Oh, wow. wow. And I can get an extension to go on here where I can cut a 28 foot log. Right now it's set up for 20. I can cut a 20 foot log. Yeah, yeah it, you just listen to it. You listen to your engine. That gives you your speed. If you're going too fast, it's going to start pulling your engine down a little bit. And I'm telling you what, this thing can plant all. Just about as fast as you can go back and forth. You better have somebody pulling logs off. I mean, the, the Boards. Logs. Yeah. Pretty nice. Pretty nice. Made in Indianapolis. I looked up on your Facebook. I believe it's Tommy Grass and Forgun. It is. Yep. That's their headquarters. They have another factory. I've not seen one. I didn't have North Carolina. Yeah. Eastern U.S. Eastern U.S. What do y'all do with all this? Fell sawdust. Extra wood for firewood and stuff too. Yeah, I know. I saw it. That's a lot. You're going to put a lot of rain. And then I took the sawdust and I put pads in the garden. Yeah. So I want to make more um, raised beds for us. And I have a couple of coming in my mouth. Dogs are protected. Look at him, Dad. <laughs> well, this is the uh, uh, St. Croix. A uh, they've got Todd Menham, Margaret's uh, Cotton Belly, Florida Navy, just a tiny bit of dormant. We've got uh, five guardian dogs in there with them. Uh, that one that's running over there, that's the one we just got back. Uh, that's a bad story about her, the, the lady that bought her a terrible health crisis and had to sell the farm. And I was able to buy that dog back. And I am super good at her. She's an awesome dog. And her brother down there in the office. Maybe it's the other way around. I believe that's the male, the female down the back. You can't really tell them apart. They're both marked up pretty close. Uh, there's about 120, 130 ewes in here. Um, that dog is limping right there. That's the only dog in here that you can touch. She'll come up to me, anybody, and just let you pet her. She'll fall on the back and let you rub her belly. She's a good little female. I think there might have been a, a fight around the feed, and she got her foot bit along the other dog. See her? Look at her. She's going underneath the dog feeder right now. She's going to get her a snack. Let, let's walk up by the dog feeder, and I'll show you. Everybody turn around and face the photographer. Hey, cheese! Hey, hamburger! Cheeseburger. All right. It's where you want to be. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I wonder how they did the feeder. So the paddocks are walking on. 
been in this thing for three days. We normally move them every two days. We just got busy at the grade school, and the boys moved them this morning. Okay. So they were here this morning. Yeah, they were in here this morning. Yeah, uh, half of those dogs over there are sick, and a few of them hurt. Uh, you got a dog that's roaming real bad on you, won't stay there. home, get them sick. Yeah, basically you pick out what you think is going to be decent and you keep it. Folks, y'all can step over this wire. If you can step over that. Absolutely, it's not. So this is the guillotine feeder that was killing our sheep. Now, young lambs would get their head under there, and about the time they got under there, this was laying down on that 2 by 10 and there'd be a sheep jump up on top of that and it'd break their neck. So we modified it. We put these barbs in there, raised it up eight inches on the back, put these bumpers in here, and now today we, we, we've never lost the sheep since we did that. Same mineral feeder as the cows, except for this one has copper in it, and the sheep, the cattle mineral feeder does not. So this is dragged from paddock to paddock. Um, I didn't give our sheep any mineral for the first 10 years. All they got was loose livestock salt. That's it. And my thought process behind that, folks, was a sheep actually grazes so much differently. They go after a lot of the woody stuff. And I'm like, you know, there's a lot of minerals on those leaves. They don't get any mineral. Well, then Mark Bader, the owner of Free Choice, he wanted to sell me more mineral. <laughs> He's like, Greg, you're really missing out. You need to get those sheep on free choice. They're going to do better. I think you'll have a higher lambing percentage. And so last fall, we switched them over. And uh, we've always averaged about 1.3, one, between 1.2 and 1.3 lambs per ewe. Now, you got to realize, we're, we're lambing on pasture. We're not jugging them. We don't flush them with any grain. It's just natural like a deer. This year, uh, we hit uh, 1.8. Wow. <laughs> so, that paid for quite a bit of mineral. Paid for a lot of mineral. And I just tell that the health of the sheep are a little better. So that's, that's what we're doing. Uh, Can you show on this side? We didn't get to see the stuff you, the modifications. Yeah, pick, pick it up. Yep. There it is. So it's got uh, 16 different, well, it's actually got 20 holes. We're using 16 of the 20, I believe it is. And the modifications? And then you put that stuff the modifications up. Those. Oh, this, oh, yeah. they this, the head track. this. So when this flap goes down, look at this face there. Sheep can easily stick his head in there. If a lamb or a ewe jumps up on here, it doesn't break their neck. Before, it, they had to work at it to get that thing up. That's a, that's a heavy cut. You got a little 20-pound lamb, 30-pound lamb, gets his head in there and then pow. There they were, laying there with their neck broke. Perfectly healthy lamb, clean tail, damn. If you buy one of those bull mineral feeders, make sure you get one that has a bow in it because if they get in there, they'll die too. They're not like a cat, they're tender. That's why they're so easy to kill. Dogs and coyotes. Yeah, they're not like a cat. They're tender. So we have some mineral feeders that are tender. Yeah, they're 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 tender. Yeah, he looks at it, he'll send a group text to Bitten and Isaac and I. So we have it on our phone, we know exactly which ones to bring. And if it needs seven of them, we only bring three. Because you can't get seven bags on that folder with Ben and I and Isaac all three on it. <laughs> <laughs> which, which one do you have to replace the most often? Uh, probably selenium and phosphorus are the two that they're really hammering. And they're, they're working on the copper pretty good. They're going after the copper. No, this is free choices. We modified it. Um, the cattle one, which y'all got to see a little bit of the other day, it's got a, a cover on this twice that thick. I mean, it's heavy. This is more like for sheep. It's a thinner, it's conveyor belting. That's what that is. Uh, we had a young guy here last week at the school, and he built one, and he sent me a picture of it. I was impressed. 
and I don't know what he had in it. He didn't tell me, but he built one. And it looked just a, almost identical to that. So you can build them. You run them at thirds, or you can get by with this? Yep. This is what we had the bowls on. So the, we had 79 bowls running with those sheep and dogs. This is what the bowls ate. Yep. I think that's about 290, 300 from free choice to the feeder itself. Is it? Yeah. Okay. They were 180, and they went up to 200. 300 now. <laughs> yeah. I like it. It works good. It pulls e pulls fairly easy. Folks, you can't pull that with a two-wheel drive pull either unless it's really dry. And most of the time, you're going to have dew on the ground. Uh, I did put steel runners on this one, so it comes with a 4x4. Four four. Put your piece of angle iron on the bottom of that. That steel will save your runners. If you drag it one year around your farm and you hit a gravel road, there went your runners. That's what I need to put on my fly trail. There you go. Yep. That's angle iron on the bottom. Let's move over here to the the, the uh, dog feeder. You pull it up the road. Yes, these are all pulled up the road. You can pull this dog feeder down the road. There's no weight to it. So you're not dragging off your runner. But that big middle feeder, you'll drag your runner off in one year. So, uh, yeah, there. there it is. You don't have a donkey, do you? No. Nope. Because he would open this up. Absolutely. And tear it up. That's why cows would too. Yeah, but. the bulls would. The bulls would flip it up with their nose, and we this broken now, obviously. But we used to put a bungee over the top of it to keep it closed. Uh, that feeder will hold 70 pounds. When you park the feeder, make sure it's facing south. How long does this last your five years? Oh gosh, that's going to last us. Let's see, today is uh, Saturday. We probably won't need to put any feed in there until Friday. Yeah, like five days ish. Yeah. yeah. It depends on the weather. Yeah, the weather. And How big a dog you got? I think coons would stay out of this because of the, they feel trapped. Oh yeah. Now, possum. Back when I had root, yeah, they don't think about it. Scared me to death. <laughs> oh, that's that door to the dang ugly possum. Look at it. I about peed my pants. I always could catch them, though. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, that possum, we find them dead all the time. And they're usually at within distance of this feeder. What's the wooden bar? Uh, for uh, stiffness. When you pull this thing, okay. you don't want it flexing. So let me share, you, share with you all my new design. I haven't built it yet, but this actually came from somebody else. I forgot who told me about it. But as soon as I heard it, I'm like, man, i got to do that. So you got young dogs, uh, and you're just getting them introduced into the flock. They're getting whipped. Now, there is. There's a, there's a pack. There's a pack. you got your alpha, and you got the lowest one on the totem pole. Well, those young dogs, they're always watching that alpha. If she's not around, they'll slip in and get them a bite to eat. If that alpha catches them in here, this is when they first become part of the pack. After a while, they kind of ignore them. But that young dog will come in here, and here comes old Meanie, traps the door, it got him cornered, and he's got to go back by that alpha to get out of here. Okay? The new design, this is going to be over here on the side, and I'm going to have another trap door like that on that side. So when the alpha dog comes in to whip his butt, he can go up, here comes Junior, boom, gone. He doesn't have to go back out by the alpha. Uh, yeah. Smart. It's a, it's a flow, it's a flow through system. So this is gonna be mounted over here. Greg, doesn't Free Choice have an axle option on their mineral? Sorry to change that. They do, I've why got don't it, you I've never that? put it on. Why don't, why wouldn't? It's too heavy, <coughs> it's gonna chew up your pastures. How do you move it on the road? Drag it. Oh, okay, wow. Greg, why do you point it to the south? Uh, the reason you point it to the south is we don't ever get any dry, hard rains from the south. And so when the rain hits this, it's going to run down in that feeder and you've ruined your dog feed. So if you get a hard driving rain out south, which we don't get, if you face that west, I promise you, you'd have water in the bottom of that feeder. It's ruined. If your dog feed gets soft and mushy, clean it out. Don't make him eat that. Did you say something about the door getting hot too? Sometimes? Yes, uh, we really need to put a tarp over this. So if we build another one, we might build this up a little bit higher so we can get a tarp over it. On a 95 degree day, I reached down there one day to check the feet and about burned my finger off. I'm like, whoa, 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 this is not gonna work. The dogs get that on their nose. Mm -hmm. They're not gonna eat either. So 
shade cloth would be better. The buzzer. Yeah. Our dogs don't like buzzards. So if a big bird gets down too low around the dogs, they're just barking their head off running. I kind of like that. You want them to watch the sky. Yeah, because you got eagles that come after baby lambs and such like that. Hey, Greg. Yep. Yours, so this is something that somebody last week pointed out to us, which was, because you, you mentioned us before, well, I'm not really sure how necessary that back cross piece is. Well, George was telling us that he was having problems with his withers getting their head underneath that bar right here yeah and knocking the no no, no. so he did so he didn't have this cross piece yep. here yep and so he, he he had problems with his withers getting in here because they'd go under and they'd oh, use their heads and hit it up and then they'd walk in and get themselves some dog food but he's like oh you have a cross piece because now if a wither comes in and tries to hit it up this will come up and hit him in the belly and so they won't really be able to get in but the dogs just slip underneath yep. so there's actually like a pretty important function maybe for that. I've had this feeder for 18 years. Uh, this is a prototype, but it, it still has the original hog panel on it. Um, in 18 years, I've only seen one sheep in it, and that was this spring. Remember that? Yeah, that was weird. We found one sheep in it in 18 years. So, And baby lambs. You don't find the baby lambs in there. Uh, a, a goat, forget about it. Oh, They'd be in there in 10 seconds. So if you want a goat feeder, here's how you build it. You use the exact same one, except for right here on the back. Don't turn on that siren, Greg. Right? Uh, there's a 30-gallon barrel right here. Or you could use a 12-inch culvert. And it, it comes out the back, and of course it's sealed up on the side. And so the goats come up and looking down that culvert. Well, on the inside of the culvert, you put a, uh, a rug. You slice a rug and you, and you screw it to that culvert. So it's hanging down, it's dark. That goat looks down in it, it's like, man, I can smell that dog feed. But there might be a coyote on the other side of that culvert. <laughs> they will not go through it. You can't push a goat through it. But the dogs, they don't like going through it either to start with, so you use meat. Put you some meat scraps in there. Them dogs are going to get it. <laughs> yeah. They never try to go over the top? No, never, ever. The first dog feeder I built, I'm glad you brought that up, I had this wire panel clear down on the ground, and I took a pair of bolt cutters, and I cut me a, about an 8 by 10 hole right here. My gosh, I about starved my dog to death. Okay. Rue would not go through that, no way, no how. But she, she accustoms that to getting shot. You know, our fences, that's where you get hurt. Okay. She would not go through that. If they'll slide under it in a heartbeat, a big dog can get under there. So, yeah, that's that's it. I've used a dog carrier and put a shade cloth over the top, and like the dark, they don't want to go in there, and it worked real good, too, but this is easier to manage. How high is that off the ground? Uh, this one right here is 10 inches, and I cut a bar out. We got um, big boy, big boy back there. He's a monster of a dog. He can't get in there. And so I cut another two inches off. I think that's 12 inches now. But we still haven't found a sheep in there, so I think we're still good. And Ben, you're you're probably right. That that board. Well, it was George. I won't take credit. Yeah, for it. yeah. <laughs> George, you're probably right. Yeah. <laughs> How do you keep? You said you, the lambs can get through. Never found the lamb in here. I found an, uh, about a seven, eight months old uh, young sheep in here this winter or this spring. It's the only one I've ever seen in here ever. Did you call her? No. <laughs> I'm just curious if she went yeah. back in. There. I probably should have ate her. No, we haven't seen her back. I, and she didn't like being in there. You could tell she was uncomfortable. Yeah, that's right. Couldn't get out there. She was thrashing around trying to figure out how she got in and how to get out. I'm not sure she even ate any dogs. Do you move the sheep as often as you move the cattle? No, every two days. So I have to come check them. Every two days. <laughs> yeah. Sheep take care of themselves. They, uh, they're a lot less work. Uh, there's lower maintenance on sheep. Uh, of course, in the last two winters, zero hay, and a zero grain, zero worming, zero tail. You don't have to clip the tails. No trimming of hooves, no weaning, um, no shots. The only shots they get 
or so we plant, uh, band the rams, the little rams, they use the little green rubber bands. Uh, we give them a tetanus, a tetanus shot. Because if you don't, you, you could lose a couple from tetanus. Um, when do you put your rams in, Will? Uh, the rams go in December 1st. Until when? May 1st. They stay in there. So uh, I'm glad you, good question. I mean, this is awesome. Take your rams, put them in there, leave them. Why are you going to take your ram out after 30 days? They're going to breed all the ewes in 10. I mean, it's unbelievable how quickly they get with it. You just leave your <laughs> rams in there you really? No, the rams come out July 4th. You so put them in when? Put them in December 1st, take them out around July 4th. If you wait till the end of July, those ewes will start cycling, and they're going to be winter, winter land. But as long as it's extremely hot like that, the ewes just don't come in. And that's because they're milking pretty hard. They're still milking pretty hard. They don't, they don't cycle. So most of the year you have, when you're taking out the bulls and the rams, you have three herds that you're rotating. Because um, some of the time, it's the yep. year when the bulls are out, the rams and ewes are together and vice versa. Well, the, the Other bull, than a when month the bulls overlap. go in, the rams are still in with the sheep. Yeah. So that's just two herds. Yeah, for about a month or so, right? Yeah, well, until they get done lambing, then we'll put the bulls back in with the sheep. Okay. See, when you're lambing with this many sheep, you run out of forage for the bulls because you can't move the bulls fast enough because the sheep, you can't move that fast. you got, you know, 150 baby lambs. They're not going to keep up with those bulls. So that's why we had to leave and take off with the bull rotation. And they started lambing. We had to leave the, the uh, lambs and the ewes behind. And once the ewes and lambs finished lambing, we rejoined them back together. And they were fine. The lambs were very mobile. They could run, they could keep up, and it was all good. How old are your lambs when you sell them? How old are the lambs when we sell them? 16 weeks old. Were they Four weigh? months. What do they weigh usually? 40 to 60 pounds. Somewhere in that time. You're, not, you're selling them as stock. withers, uh, castrated withers. That's one market. Okay. We're selling breeding stock on ram lambs, and then we're also selling breeding stock on ewe lambs. Okay. Ewe lambs are your biggest market, as long as they're the right kind. So uh, I sold some sheep to a lady in Arkansas, and she called me back about five years later. Her and her brother had broke up the farm, and they were getting rid of the sheep. She said, I want you to sell these sheep for me. And I said, well, what's your management protocol? Well, you know, we worm them spring and fall. We, we worm the lambs when they need it. I'm like, I can't sell those sheep. Well, why not? I said, because you're not, you're not doing it the way we do it. So if you're going to sell sheep, they've got to be low maintenance, easy keeping, no worm sheep. There's a huge market for those type of sheep. People don't have time to be worming their sheep. We're all busy. We're all busy. We don't need to be worming lambs. But you do need to move them. And I can tell you this, the, the sheep health has improved since we started strip grazing them. Because see, before, there's about, um, I bet there's 20 acres here in this field. I'd get them the whole 20 acres. Now, I would leave them in here for two weeks, because this is a big patty. And I'd watch the ironweed. When the ironweed leaves were stripped, that's when I moved them. Well, now we're going to get one, two, three, four. We're getting four moves out of the same pasture, but they're being moved every two days with a back fence kept in. So they can't go back on that campsite. Do you all notice all that manure up there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's where they've been sleeping at. The and they would be sleeping there tonight if they were able to, but they can't. they got to find them a new campsite around there somewhere. It's going to be a high point. It won't be down in the bottom. So we're very fortunate on this farm. We've got a great big lake right down there. They'll be watering out of. And then there's a pond up on the ridge that they've been on. So we've got two water points on this paddock. So where's the water source for this paddock? Straight through those woods. And they go down there and get yep. the water. There's an open ridge. It goes down to a picnic table. It's just a beautiful, beautiful pond. Surrounded by white oak timbers. It's really nice. What do you, what do you give the dogs for water in the winter since you don't water the uh, We don't water the dogs in the winter. Uh, they go down to a pond and they chew on ice. <laughs> Folks, if you look at a pond on a really cold day, go to the south side that's catching sunlight, there's a little bit of water right where it touches the bank. And I've seen dogs in there licking on that water. Or they'll go to a creek, they'll find them a spring. 
They do fine. Yep. I want, I want to ask Greg Brown what, how he manages his bull and rams with his it's similar word, yeah. with with what? Yeah, how, how do you split them, them up? Out? No. Yeah, pull them up. Yeah. yeah. Them out, yeah. So I'll I'll keep them in there until three months till the lambs or ram lambs are three months old. When you got to worry about them is summer solstice. After summer solstice and the days get longer, that's when they'll rebreed. So I, I'll leave them in there and they then I pull them and I put the bulls with them after the bulls get pulled. So uh, the rams stay together. But in general, I turn in November, but I'm warmer than Greg. So I'm saying... You're, you're what, two months ahead of me? I don't or at least know. a good our, month. Our frost-free date is October... Well, our first frost is October 20th. And then our frost-free day is April 20th or so. Okay. So, um, yeah. Anyway, we'll, we'll breed about November 1. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see, if I, if I put in later. rams here in November 1... I'm going to lose some land because in April we can still get snow here and it can be cold, freezing rain. Folks, when a baby lamb's born, it only weighs six to eight pounds. He's a little bitty guy. Now, once he gets up and shakes off and gets all of that TD, he's good to go, but he may not get up. If that ground's really cold, it takes all the energy out of him. He never got a chance to suck. So, green grass, warm evenings, and that's nice. Don't fight nature. Everybody's lambing here in January. You know why they're doing that? Show Stupid. Lambs. What else? <laughs> huh? Show lambs. Show lambs. That's a good one. What else? That's what their dad did. That's no. when they're easy to breed. Easter. Oh. Everybody wants to sell Easter lambs. That's the highest time of the year that you get for your life. Well, I'm sorry. If you figure out all the dead ones you lost getting that Easter lamb, you're losing money. And the labor, oh. I was on a big sheep operation. He had uh, 1,200 jug pins, 1,200, inside this massive barn. I'm like, what is all this? Well, it's raw lamb. He had 1,200 pins. And how'd you like to lamb those ewes? <laughs> so, Greg, when do we butcher these? Uh, yeah, so we used to butcher uh, a lot of these lambs around Christmas as what we call Christmas lambs, and uh, they're not very big. If you wait for that lamb to get a year old, officially once they turn 12 months of age, you're not supposed to call them a lamb, they're a mutton. Right. I don't care what you call them, they're better. But that's for wool sheep. <laughs> yeah. The lanolin, yeah, the lanolin. So you don't have, with the hair sheep, you don't have the lanolin. I remember my dad skinning a little sheep and fed our family. That was the nastiest piece of meat I ever put in my mouth. <laughs> it was awful. It's like you're eating wool. And it's because they let the lanolin touch the meat. It really gives it a strong flavor. I don't care for the smell of it. And when you cook it, it about runs you out of the house. The hair sheep, I feel like you can keep them 18 months and they yes. still lamb. Yep. Greg, we butchered a three-year-old ram. I had clamping. I actually abandoned him when he was two. He got wormy on me. I'm like, I'm going to make a wither out of you. So I abandoned him. I forgot he was in there. I went out there to sort one day, and I see this massive sheep. I'm like, what in the world? I went to the house and got my 22, and I shot it. I couldn't get it up on my foot either by myself. The thing must have weighed 180 pounds. And Bowen and I, we got it in the truck, and Jan said, you're going to grind that. I'm like, nope. I'm a steak man. <laughs> I want some steaks. So we made the front shoulders into steaks and ground the rest of the ram. And those front shoulders are about as good a lamb I've ever ate. Three year old. And he bred for two years. So. And in 18 months, it is, and you got a nice layer of uh, fat across the back of your sheep. Folks, we sold those little lambs at Christmas. People come to pick them up, they take the processing on them. Here's your lamb. <laughs> and it was in a shopping bag. And they're like, well, where's the rest of it? I'm like, this is it. And I'd tell them as they walked out, I said, just don't invite Billy Bob over for dinner. Because <laughs> he'll eat the whole thing at one sitting. It was really good. It was tender, but there wasn't much of it. Here's the deal. I'm going to tell you all straight up. It cost $85 to get a lamb cut. Is it 100 now? 
Okay, it costs you $100 to get one processed. That's skinned, vacuum sealed, and you, know, you pick it up. That's for a 60-pound lamb or a 130-pound lamb. Hmm. They just go by the head. So why wouldn't you go with the bigger one? It's a no-brainer. Are the proce processing regulations different for lamb than they are for beef? No. Same. Processing regulations are the same. Yeah. How long would it take you to get to 130 pounds, though? 130 pounds on grass uh, with St. Croix, no dorper influence. Um, it's going to take you probably 12 months. 12 months, okay. Yeah. If you got decent grass. You might get better than that. What do you think, Greg? Uh... I think it's about what it's going to be yeah. at, at the earliest, really. So yeah, if you put dorper influence in there, you might get them a little bigger than that. Boy, I like a dorper lamb, but man, it's just hard to get without worming. Mm -hmm. And folks, you see how we're moving these sheep? The dorpers died under this management. They couldn't take it. Because of the rainfall and everything? Else. Just being infected with parasites. They just don't have the parasite resistance, period. But in Texas, around Spur, Robert Glass has got the prettiest band of sheep I've ever laid eyes on. And he's never wormed them. And they're pure dorper. <laughs> yep. Let's walk there and just kind of take a get. Well, the sheep are gone. <laughs> well, here they are. Right over here. Yeah. Four sheep in the back there. I love those sheep. They got black ears, a black muzzle. Um, but if you get them in a crowd with you, you really have to protect your face. Because when you walk in and, and get them cornered, they will jump right over the top of your head. <laughs> They're tremendous athletes. The rest of those, it's got the uh, color on them. There'll be a cross between Katahdin, Florida Native, and St. Croix. So we've sold all the coals out. We did that uh, about two weeks ago. Those are all sold at the sale board. And I thought we would get maybe around, you know, 50, 60 bucks for them. Uh, those call used brought right at $100. I was tickled to death. I couldn't believe it. We got rid of them because they were showing bone. Uh, some of them were getting short of the tooth. You know, they ground their teeth down. And if they're, if they're thin in September, the 1st of September, they're going to be more thin in December. And now they've ate three months of your grass. What would you do that for? Get rid of them. <laughs> so with these sheep, you get a ewe lamb out of those this coming May. You bring that thing home, and at seven months of age, which would be December 1st, you put the ram into them. About 60% of those ewe lambs will breed that first year. The rest of them uh, will for sure breed the second year. And we like to have a single lamb. We don't like to have twins the first time. Twins on a fresh ewe is hard on them. It'll pull them down. They may not breed back, and it might even pull them down low enough that they get parasites. And then you lost that again. You talked about the death triangle, and you talked about the ridges on the on the tail of cattle. What are some easy ways uh, with the with the sheep, lamb? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, look at the frame of the sheep starting at the front of the neck, back to the butt. And you'll see that even though you got to get a little closer, there should be fat cover all the way down that sheep. If you can count vertebrae coming down the backbone, and then the back hips, the back hips are a little bony looking, uh, that would be one you'd call. There's a young you right there. She's got a little bit of a blanket left on her, and she's not shed off 100%. I don't get too excited about that on a young ewe lamb. But the next year, she'll probably be slick as a button. It's the same way with yearling calves. A yearling calf coming out of winter. So he's, he's, he's starting to turn his first birthday. Don't get all freaked out if he doesn't slick off. He will. He's just a little bit slower than the two-year-olds. And, of course, the cows will be the first ones to slick off. They're just a little bit slower. We can't tell much about them, but this second one back <laughs> here... The, the second one back there, I mean, overall, they look for great condition, but I'm looking for one to call. Yep. See the one laying down the second one? <laughs> we can't see it. It's not even standing up much, but it has the look of a call. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Somebody, let me walk down there. I'll just walk. And it's probably old age. Yeah. 
That's one, and we'll look at the tail on it. It may have a dirty tail. The dirty tail, what's that a sign of, y'all? Parasites. What, what, what are the parasites? Barbapole. There's worms, and then there's the barbapole, and then there's also the uh, protozoa, which would be the coccidios. Coccidios. So you can see she doesn't have any near the fat cover as the one in front of her. Yeah. 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 She's a little off in condition, not bad. And she, if the rest of them looked the like that, then you wouldn't be so concerned about her. But as the group looks, she's a cull. Yeah. And it'd be January when she's really going to look bad. Right now, she'll be fine for the next few months. But it'd be nice to sell her. And January's not a bad place to get rid of culls, but she's going to lose weight between now and then. Yeah. But I don't see any others. There's one, that white one with her head high, but she looks like a good looking doe, so I'd hate to get rid of her or you. Uh, but her condition's a little off. Yeah, there, there's two or three in there that we missed. I know so that we moved them. It's not a one call process. You're yeah. gonna I call about three or four times a year. Yeah. Really just came and you same thing with a mature herd, you do about 10% with sheep as well? Well, probably 20% with sheep, but you know, from what we're looking at, unless they culled recently, you know, we're just talking about three out of 120, was it? Or, yeah, yeah, so not not a high percentage at all, so 4%. Could I give a wire in the woods there, or, or how, how, what's the fencing like? Yeah, what's the fencing like down in there? Uh, yeah, there's one single hot wire um, around the lake to keep the cattle out, but the sheep can go underneath the water. You don't have to worry about sheep climbing off in your pond. They're not going to do it. Uh, the only time a sheep will jump in a pond is if you've got a ram on one side and a bunch of ewes on the other. So remember that a lake is not a fence for a bunch of rams when they smell a ewe. They will swim it. And they hate water, but they'll swim that lake and they'll go breed those ewes. Will they follow the ponds the like a cow will? No. Yeah. Well, now if you have a campsite on a hill right above the pond, that's where they camp for the whole year, yeah. That manure is... But could, they're not going to go stand no, in it. No, they're not going to get in the pond. They don't like it on their feet. It's hard on their feet. But can they drink? They can go to a pond yes. and drink at yes. the watering point? Yes. So you don't need to set up something special? That no. If they have direct access? Sheep aren't so hard on the bank, but goats will wear out the bank running around that pond. Have have okay, yeah. We got real thick cattails around our pond. Will they, will they help knock that down and eat some of if it? If they can not? reach them, especially in the springtime, they'll eat those cattails. Okay. Good. Yep, when they're tender. Now when they get real woody, we haven't had much luck with the sheep eating them. Cows will eat cattails when they're young. Eat the heck out of them. Um, this is the back of Steve and Cindy's original farm. Matter of fact, uh, Jan and I, the first time we met Steve and Cindy, we were in this paddock. And we were coming up that ridge, Jan and I, we had a chainsaw. And uh, Jan, <laughs> Jan had a two-wheel dolly. Like you move a refrigerator with. <laughs> she was pulling the dolly, or she was pushing and I was pulling. I had the chainsaw strapped on my back. And uh, we had a a spinning jenny tied to it, 4,000 feet of wire. We didn't have a four-wheeler. We didn't have the money to buy a four-wheeler. And we were fighting the briars and the brush, and I looked up, and here came Steve and Cindy down this ridge with their youngest daughter, Bridget. And what did it look like? You couldn't hardly see them. I mean, this was just brush. This whole thing was just brush. And they were fighting through the briars, and they were all cut up, and we were cut up, and we introduced ourselves, because I'd only met him on the phone. And we'd already signed the 10-year lease. And uh, so that was the start of it, the first time we ever saw them. And we, we hit it off, and of course, you know the rest of the story, they gave us a lifetime lease. But because we did this, you know, Steve and Cindy live in Dallas, Texas. They couldn't have done this. No way. And so we've got a lifetime lease. I'll tell you the rest of it. It's a free lease. We don't pay them anything. But I did line their entire farm for them. I did something like that. Um, you know, we, we, we take care of it. He's more interested in deer. He is a deer nut. He is. He just focuses on white-tailed deer. And so that's what we have to work with him on, too. So if he wants to put in a stand, we'll kind of help him with that. We'll try and make the, the forage better around his deer stands. you got to do stuff like that. 
see how the sheep are bunched up? If you ever come out and look at your sheep and they're all bunched up, there's some issue. They're looking at us as the predator right now and they've all gotten together in one group. If they're all spread out, they're comfortable. But if you see them grouped up, something's gone on. And it's, you know, we're, we're different out here and they're not used to a big group like this. But that's what you want if you were moving them you don't want half of them over there and half over here. You got to get them bunched up like that before you go to move them. So, great point. Yeah, how do we move them? So I'm in the front on the foiler. Ben and Isaac are at the back. And all I'm doing is going sheep, 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 sheep. And here they come. And just a little tiny pressure at the back. Don't get too close to the sheep. If they stop and nervously looking at you, don't you dare take another step. Because the whole bunch of them will turn around, and if one takes off, they're with the whole flock. The circle around you. Stand your ground. Don't take one more step. That's the flight zone. That's the flight zone. And that flight zone on a sheep is a whole lot different than a cow. Yeah. Hmm. You saw a cow yesterday. You could walk through them. They didn't pay any attention to it. Or the day before. You can't do that with those sheep. How long does it take to get new sheep and get them used to being moved? Um, you know, it, it took me probably two to three weeks to kind of get them onto it. Um, and now, yeah, I used to shake a bucket of corn, just shell corn. Because we and, had a few that were... Yeah, they were wild. They'd get out. The only way you'd get them back is with a bucket. But we had a few that were trained to a bucket. Yep. We had one old you in here. Oh, gosh, I miss her. And we named her Pet You. <laughs> <laughs> and she was a Barbados bike belly. And you could tell, I think she'd been raised on a bottle. Oh, yeah. She would come up and nuzzle your pockets looking for a lifesaver or something. She and, was, she, and she hit your hand. Yeah, she was an awesome sheep. And I'll be dang, we had a young guardian dog went rogue and killed her. Ripped her, ripped her throat out. Hmm. Yep. That happens. You when got you sheep. bring the new ones in, they're likely to be the last one to move. And they're just saying, where's everybody going? Because they're not used to the rotation. Yeah. But after a few rotations, they'll be in the middle of the group. There was a guy in Texas, his last name was Merritt. He lives around Dallas, I gotta get his name. He had a large flock of sheep, like 2,000. And the way he sorted his sheep from calls, he was very unique. He would take them and move them out of the paddock and he'd bring them up through this lane and he'd, he'd be sitting at the gate. And the last 30 sheep, he just closed the gate. Closed the gate, didn't let them come through. Those are the 30 that he sold. <laughs> That's a uh, real good way to do it with sheep. <laughs> the last 30 through, he just... You can almost do it with cows. Yep. The last ones to come through, those are the ones that were wormy mm -hmm. or having some kind of sign, and he just... That's the way he sold it. He didn't get them all up and go through them. He just used that sheep, moved it up. I thought that was pretty unique. <laughs> Any other questions on the sheep? All right. Yeah, uh, only when we uh, sort to call, like in the fall, or if we're taking, um, or, of course, the ewes all got to come out when we do the, the castration. Then we sell the ewe lambs, they got to come out. So we sort through them, and that's the only times we get them up. You look at their teeth, you said something about their teeth. You yeah, look at just we're looking at body condition. Up. Yeah, body condition. So how many times a year, when do we do that? July 4th, around that time period. And then we sell them. All the sheep that are sold on this farm are August 29th and 30th every year. This year we had uh, about 14 states came in here and bought sheep, and we got it all done in two days. I think we had one guy carry over till Sunday. The most of it was done on Friday, Saturday. Was that ewe lambs or all, everything? Everything. Ewe lambs, ram lambs, withers. We always keep up a few withers, even though we don't have them sold, and here's why. When you buy a ram lamb, it's awful nice to have a wither to put with him. Because you bring him home and you put him in a cage, I don't care where you put him at. If he doesn't have a buddy, he is not going to be a happy ram. And so we, sold, we sell quite a few withers with people that just buy a ram. They never thought about it. And you know, we'll, we'll cut them a, a deal on the withers and get some a little cheaper, but they need something with that ram. Greg, what's a wither? A wither is a castrated ram. Okay, I think we're, 
I don't see any more hands going up. Why don't we uh, go back to the house and uh, we'll get rehydrated and I'm going to do a, a quick closing. And those of you all that drove it want to leave from here, that's fine too. But otherwise, we're going to meet back where we started at. So we started with this one wire, we actually had three, and the bottom wire, two down here on the bottom, second clip up right here. And this would have been number one, number two, and number three right here. And we moved the three wires for about three months. Once we got sheep staying in behind three wires, we took two, we took one off. And so we took this one off right here and just put the distance. This one came down to here. And that one came up to here. We did that for another two months. Once we had the sheep standing in behind that, then we went to that one. People who buy uh, sheep from you, do they usually stick with the one wire? Oh well, yeah, that's what we're selling. That's why we have a really good market. Is we can say, look, you buy these sheep, you can go home with the poly wire, you can put them in your yard, and you can start grazing right there in your yard, and they're gonna stay in. So you wouldn't need a perimeter? No, absolutely not. Folks, you know how much money and time Jan and I spent on this farm? I can't imagine. Putting in 16 permanent sheep paddocks, four wires on all four sides. Matter of fact, Jan, bless her, bless her heart, she stuck with me. She probably should have sent her nuts. But by July, Jan had had enough. Somebody And she's like, are we going to build proof again this weekend? Yeah, honey, but just remember, when we get it all built, we'll never have to do it again. <laughs> I'd tell her that the next weekend. <laughs> we finally got it all built. And, but you know what? I can say thousands of dollars. There it is right over there. There's a permanent sheep tent. That's a four wire. The top one's 32, more for the cows. There's three more wires below them. They're all high tensile. And then there's a permanent sheep gate over there. But anyway, so back to here, we started, we first started, the, the posts are actually 12 feet apart. Now we're stretching out to about 16. I'm going to keep it at 16 for probably another year. I might start pushing 20. I'm just scared to death I'm going to train them to go under. Yeah, yeah I wouldn't go through. It just takes a few more posts, but you know what? When you can run your animals across your farm and you don't have any fence, with that? Are you kidding me? That's power. That's real power. Yeah, I may increase my sheep again if I can get to this. Yeah, absolutely. So, but now, it's, it's, see how tight it is? It's like a fiddle string. Oh, I want to show you this. Hold on. So you get out of your paddock, and you've, you've hooked it on hot at the far end. You drive your foil back across. You get over here like, golly, what's wrong? Why is it so loose? This is your self-tightener. So he's twisting it. Oh, wow. <laughs> Tighten it up on the post. Stick it in the ground. I mean, it is tight now. Another way to do it is put a zigzag in it, but then I like this technique. <laughs> now just twist it. it. It works really good. Yeah, you don't have to go back and grab your reel. Now we ran out of wire here. Yeah, so we pulled it out and just kept right on going. There's the double knot. I think I might have tied that one. That's an ugly looking knot. <laughs> I think there's three in there. And then it's, it's hooked on hot right over there on the, on the high tensile fence. Folks, once you get your sheep broke to one hot wire, you don't need to go up there and be putting it on the fence. Permanent. Use this. Because when this comes out, my deer hunter comes in in his fall, he doesn't have to mess with any wires. There's nothing out. He's got this beautiful open 20 acre field. Uh, at five, 5 o'clock in the morning when they're stumbling around. Yeah, they're dark. <laughs> but you'd start, them, you'd start them with the same fence except three wires. Three wires. Like when they, they show, when they show up the first day, three wires. there's three wires yep. on that. Three wires, 8,000 volts. What, if you 8, don't have 8,000 volts in it, don't start. Now, this one right now probably has, anybody got a meter on them? Probably around six. It's probably six to eight thousand. Put your hand on it, honey. <laughs> <laughs> I'll drop the mic. Please. I am not. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he's gonna get it. Not me. Show us where you put the three wires. So you got. Oh, we got a three wire fence. I'd have one down 
here. I had one right there, and I had another one up here. So 6, 12, and 16. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Was the bottom one ground, or were they all? Oh. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. Yep. And you got to stay with that. Just don't get, don't get discombobulated. If you come out there and you see a, a ram or something on running around. Hopefully, you know, if, you, if you're tagging your sheep, you can look right down the tag number. Get them back to the crowd calling. I don't tag my sheep, so I shoot them. I have a 22 rifle, a good scope. I shoot them right in the head. We bring them home and we skin them and we eat them. Why do you do that? Because they got out. It removes the troublemaker. I made a huge mistake when I got started. I had a sheep that would get out and they asked nothing. It'll get back in, everything's good. The next day there was eight out. The next day there was 43 out. And they were going to Harrisburg. I threw them right out. I got a call at work. Greg, there's 43 sheep headed up right out. I'm like, oh gosh. I knew they were mine because I'm the only one in the whole neighborhood that's got sheep. So I ran home and got a bucket and I didn't have any grain. So I grabbed some gravel and just threw gravel in the bucket. And I ran down that road down there by the crown and started shaking that bucket. And they turned around and they followed me all the way to the crowd. I got them. I sold them. <laughs> Problem solved. Craig, is there any, any trick to, with the fencing to treat the guardian dogs to stay in, stay with the sheep? Is yeah, that uh, that, that's a tough one. I mean, you're going to have touch. The dogs can, can come underneath there, and you'll see the, the dogs over here. You'll see the dogs over here sometimes. The puppies, they'll go underneath there. Uh, if you tie a 13 inch car tire, their collar. Boy, that slows them down. Put a long dragging chain on them. That way they're grounded real good when they get hit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they, they hit it when they run. Too. They'll learn to run like this. You know? The problem with the 13 inch car tires, they can't get in that dog seat. They can't pull the tire under that open. So we, we've come up with another deal. It's a side wall out of our opening. It weighs about 12 pounds. I mean, it's the same. Oh, yeah. You got a log chain that's fairly short, so when the dog raises his head up, he's got to pick up the eight pound rubber drag. And when he runs, that drag's smacking him on his leg. He can't pick up any speed. So it really slows him down on chasing sheep. The young dogs, they like to chase sheep sometimes. And if we had the log chains, sometimes they could wrap around the, chain, the trees. Yeah, we, we would find the dogs down in the woods. Uh, we used to use a four by four, about eight foot long. And I put a bullet point on it, so it would just bounce off everything. But I had a chain on it, maybe five feet, and those darn dogs would get down the woods and get that chain wrapped around a tree, and there he'd be, just howling his head off. Sometimes they wouldn't howl, you'd have to go find them. How quickly do they usually grow out of that with chasing sheep? I mean, is it oh, gosh, that's a $64,000 question. How soon do they grow out of being stupid? Yeah. Um, some dogs are never stupid. That little rub. Uh, this, this little dog here, um, Sheila. Sheila. Sheila's never been stupid. She's just super, super tame. I've never seen her chase a sheep. Big boy and lady over there, those two spotted ones. I came this close to just really getting rid of them. They would, they would knock sheep down every time we moved them. Just run through them, knock them flying. They didn't grab them, they just knocked them down. And I, that's going to get into some predatory behavior if I'm not careful. And so I'd haul at him, I'd slap the, slap the bag on the ground, four foot post with a black trash bag on the end of it, hit the ground, say, no! And blow me naked. <coughs> they'd do that, and if they did something stupid like follow you back to the truck, don't even get started letting them follow you. Hit the ground and make them go back to the flock. I have to get on, I don't get on, I haven't had to get on Ben and Isaac, but past interns have been terrible about it. They'll go out and check the fan and high-fiving it and talking and going back to the truck and the puppies are right behind him all the way back to the truck. One time of that, man, you've got a really bad habit to break. They like you. They like you. Tails hanging out. Tails are doing that. <laughs> Your little, little eyeballs and that little charcoal nose, they want to, they want to pet. And what you got to realize is, is they need to think they're that's part of the flock. They don't need to be humans. They do need a pet. I like to pet a dog on the head, but don't be stupid with it. You know, um, just give him a pet. Big boy, you can't catch that dog. But if you hold your hand up to real low, and, hey, damn big boy, he's just prancing around. You reach up, 
you'll smell you'll smell your hand and you'll lick it. And that's good. That's all he needed. And you're letting big boy know you appreciate his work. Dogs are very perceptive. Very perceptive. Don't hit a dog, ever. You got that bag in your hand, you hit the ground. Don't hit the dog with it. It really freaks them out. And sometimes now you've got a super timid dog. You're never going to catch that dog. You're not going to hit a hand. You can hit the ground and say no, but don't hit them with it. Remember that. You better get pushing on. Yep. Let's head on. 